thank you so much to ECHO and uh, the graciousness to uh, allow me to be uh, uh, one of the presenters. Uh, wonderful things are being presented, lots of good technologies, lots of great experiences, and uh, it's, uh, it's a, an honor to be counted among those who are presenting and to be among you who are applicators and appliers of, of technologies uh, to improve lives all around the world. And the, the theme, of course, improving lives is uh, what we're about here this week. And when Abram asked if I would uh, come and share, I, I wanted to focus a little bit of, of a different uh, idea instead of talking about some type of technology that could improve. Uh, I think we can agree that if we look around the room and, and we start talking with each other and we uh, start dialoguing, I mean, there's experts here from water to soils to plants to animals to uh, business practices, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on. And it's wonderful. We should uh, take use of those resources while we're here. What, what I thought would might be good for us to, to step back and look at would be more of the software of how do we get to those things. The technologies that are the hardware, but think of more of kind of the software. All of us in here have a phone or a smartphone, or we have computers, or we have iPads and things like that. If you have the best iPad or the best computer, which would be a Macintosh, of course, but if you had the best, whatever you would have, uh, the best piece of hardware, if you didn't have the software to make it run, it would be totally useless, except for maybe a good way to prop your door open or something like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about how do we improve lives by working with people, improving lives by working together, improving lives by understanding before trying to be understood. Uh, I hope it won't be too boring. If it is, go to sleep. It's okay. This is a safe place. You can get some rest. Uh, but also, I hope it will stimulate us to some conversation uh, throughout the week and, and talk about some things of how do we work with people and communities to get them moving towards their sustainable development. Uh, I'm going to share some lessons about uh, what we've learned through the years. Uh, my lessons may not be yours. Yours may not be mine. That's okay. I'm going to share also some key indicators that we have found in terms of sustainability uh, in looking at ha what happens with uh, technology transfer and working with folks. All of this is done in a way, in a very, a very easy dialogue way. I want it to be non-threatening. I want it to also uh, be a way that is sharing from an experience so, so you can see that. And then later on this week, maybe we'll get a chance to talk about our experiences. So anyway, there was a man. He walked into a doctor's office one day. Okay? And he walks in and he says, hello, the doctor comes out. And the doctor sees him. And before the man says anything, the doctor says to him, ah, prepare the operation room. Let's whisk him in. And they move him into operation. And they begin doing brain surgery on the man. All right? And after a few days, the man wakes up. And the doctor comes to visit him. And he says, okay, I just want to check on you. How are you doing? How are you feeling? And the man said, I, I, I'm doing okay. Yeah? And he says, well, I, I just wanted to see if, you know, if we met all your expectations. He says, well, I, I really didn't come in for surgery. He said, you didn't? What did you come in for? He said, I was coming to your office and asked where was the nearest place to repair my television. <laughs> and the doctor said, why didn't you say that? And the man said, because you didn't give me a chance to ask. And, and sometimes the things that we do, the, the technologies that we come up with, they're good technologies. They're good brain surgery. Uh, they're good things that can help people. We know that they, they are proven. They work in certain areas. We've seen them work. We've poured our life into those things. But sometimes we also take those things without even asking the people that we're working with, what is it that they really need? What is it that they really understand of these technologies that we're trying to teach and work with them? My family and I lived and worked uh, in the Philippines and then based out of Thailand for a while. Uh, then a little bit of time in Singapore, worked in several places, uh, working with uh, a, a lot of sustainable agriculture, health, water, literacy type technologies. Uh, we worked 16 years in the rural Philippines. We were based out of a place called the Mindanao Baptist Rural Life Center. A lot of the things I'm going to be sharing with you today, we have some of our partners like Mr. Jethro Adang and Joshua Ringa and others back here that we worked with uh, for several years. And uh, we we lived and uh, we, we basically worked with farming communities. Uh, my wife and I came to the Philippines in 1983. Uh, I'm trained in agriculture as a soil conservationist. Uh, she's a healthcare professional, being a nurse. I grew up on a small farm in the United States. Uh, I had a master's degree in agriculture. And in 
mainly in uh, soil erosion and conservation. And, and I came to serve on a great team of Americans, Filipinos, and other internationals with a great organization that had a, an amazing work ethic and an ethos. We developed wonderful technologies, uh, things like faith gardening, food always in the home. Some of you may have heard of those. The upland farming systems called SALT, sloping agriculture land technologies. We had SALT 1, 2, 3, and 4. We had Uplift, using properly lowland integrated farming. We had all the acronyms in the world that you could imagine. Uh, working with technologies with farmers, working with communities to help them in terms of life betterment. Uh, we dabbled in every kind of health strategy known to man, at least we thought so. Uh, ORD, medicinal herbs, etc., etc., run down the list. If your community needed a water solution, look no further. Our organization had an answer. If you needed a technology or a bit of information to answer any question, we were the place to come. But there was a problem. We worked hard all year. Jethro can tell this story, testify to it. We would work feverishly, dedicating, panting, working hard, working with agriculture, animal husbandry projects, cropping schemes, and all of that. And then at the end of the year, when we look back, we saw some good things being done, but we saw very few things that were really lasting. And then we would run to the next new technology that was out there, and we would start that, whether that was a, a new type of water filter or whether it was a new type of agriculture system. And then we would try that, but the same thing, every year we would keep looking back and see that out of every 100 home gardens that we put in, only a handful would continue. For every 30 water wells that we helped to put in, about five maybe after one year were operational. For every 20 goat projects started, people had a very nice meal at the wedding that they had, for the most part. We began to see a pattern that was emerging and coming out of our, our roots. You know, we, we prided ourselves on being a grassroots organization, uh, and, and I believe we really were, working together with farmers and farm communities to come up with appropriate technology solutions. And while we saw a lot of activity, we saw a uh, very little sustainability, all right? Now, again, I'm telling you my experience. I'm not judging anybody else's. I'm just sharing very openly with you what we saw through the years. And we began to work together as a team, both Filipinos and, and Americans and others that would come along with us. We, we began to find what we thought was a better way. And it, and it kind of became the way of what we called community development. We really didn't know what in the 80s and the 90s, we, we didn't know what to call it, really. Uh, but, but when we look back, it was kind of a way, how do we really begin working with communities based upon their needs, based upon their ideas, based upon their analysis, based upon their solutions, mainly based upon their resources. And it was amazing seeing the transformation. We still did a lot of technology. The community still got things like better roads, better water, better health, better food. But the communities were the primary actors and not us as the outsiders. Uh, I subscribe to a, a guy, one of my favorite writers about development is uh, Robert Chambers. Some of you are very familiar. He hadn't written anything in years. He may be dead. I don't know. Pardon me if he's not. But uh, he wrote a book, Whose Reality Counts, and uh, just a nice little reminder. Whose knowledge counts? Whose values? Whose criteria and preferences? Whose appraisal, analysis, and planning? Whose action? Whose monitoring and evaluation? Whose learning? Whose empowerment? Whose reality counts? Ours or theirs? At first, I thought it was really the community. At first, I thought it was ours because we had gone to the Philippines to teach people how to farm. And then after working several years and being a little bit frustrated and learning from the farmers themselves, I thought it was maybe theirs. What I began to realize, actually, it's both of us. Their reality counts. If we don't start there, we miss from the very beginning. But we do have a reality from the outside as well. So how do we work together with those on the inside? So the outsiders don't drive, but the insiders really are the ones who are doing the work and leading the development. It's sort of like uh, whose reality counts, okay? All right, this is Fluffy. Uh, he is the, whoops, let me go back. He is the destroyer of worlds, all right? You see Fluffy? Now Fluffy is only about eight inches tall, okay? Fluffy is not the destroyer of worlds, but look at Fluffy's eyes. Fluffy believes that he or she is the destroyer of worlds, all right? Fluffy is a lot like the communities we work with. Trying to understand who they are, where they're coming from, what they believe about themselves goes a long way when we're talking about sustainable development. 
when we work with them. Understanding first before trying to let them understand the things that we have to teach them. It's sort of like the farmer who dreamed one day to have a rope swing. He was thinking, ah, something nice for my children. And he thought, well, maybe a rope and a tire. But he decided he really didn't know enough, so he contacted his nice uh, agriculture extension agent. Actually, this was an agent who had uh, a, uh, actually a master's degree in tireology. Uh, he had studied it. <laughs> and so he came out to the farm, and he said, you know, uh, we have actually built a prototype in the lab, and it's actually 50% more safe, 80% more sustainable, and 30% more economical. And the farmer looked at that and he said, hmm, that's interesting, but it's not quite what I was thinking. Ah, and, the, and, and the extension agent knew exactly what the problem was. There were not enough extension agents looking at the problem. So he went back and got his professor who's a PhD in tireology. And the PhD in tireology said, we have actually developed an ultra-modern prototype that nobody has ever seen. So this one is 100% safe. Is 30% more economical, 50% more sustainable. Now, the farmer's a little bit more confused, you know? <laughs> He's thinking, I'm not sure what to do. And then the two experts from the outside decide, aha, the problem is we don't have enough experts. Yeah? So they go back and get a whole committee, <laughs> and they decide what the problem is. They build it, put it together. They have a nice turning over ceremony and a launching to the farmer, right? And they present it to him. Here it is. And they all go back to the capital city and back to the university and have a celebration of goals accomplished for the year by the institution. Now, what happens? We know. What happens when everybody has gone back and the farmer is left alone? Yeah. He goes back and he does usually what he wanted to do in the first place. So in today's plenary, I want, to, I want to share with you, just very briefly, five lessons learned uh, from working with communities in rural development. Okay? There's nothing magical about these lessons, uh, and I'm sure you have more lessons than that, but these are kind of five major ones. And then I want to talk about three key components to good community development, sort of a, a, sort of a framework that we would use to measure our projects out there. Did we really get to community development? Did we get to a project or really did we get to development? I hope you understand the difference between what I'm saying, projects and development. Projects are things we do. Development is what people do. Okay? They're not bad. Both are very viable. But when we talk about people taking charge of who they are, where they are, their poverty, moving, growing to be what they can be, created in the image of God, we're talking about the development side. First lesson that I've learned is that people have an amazing capacity for solving their problems, given a chance. Now, I am a follower of Jesus. I appreciated Andy's uh, sharing this morning in the Genesis story, because in that story also, we believe that people were created in the image of God. We call this the Imago Dei. It's the image, oh, there's Andy, thank you. It's the image of God that within the people that God has created, he has, he has placed his stamp. It doesn't mean that we are look like of God. It doesn't mean that we are becoming gods. It means that he's given us the ability to choose evil and good. He's given us the ability to create and be able to work or choose idleness or whatever. He's given us the ability to love or to hate. So God's given us this innate ability in our hearts and lives. And as a development worker, if I have the view that people are poor and helpless and they need me to come and bring something to them to help them develop, the temptation will be for me to treat them something less than what God designed them to be. All right? It doesn't mean that I cannot help or you cannot help from the outside. What I learned is it means that we really need to start where God has started, and that is he has endowed them and created them with unique abilities. I work with a lot of churches in the United States in helping them to think about ministry projects overseas. And we have a lot of dialogue and discussion. It always starts off like this. I say, well, tell me where you're working. So we're working in X country. So well, tell me about the people there. Well, they have nothing. I said, okay, they have nothing. So they're naked? They have no clothes? No, they have clothes. I said, well, they have something, okay? So, okay, tell me more about the people there. Well, um, they're, uh, they're, they're helpless. They can't help themselves. I said, oh, well, they're going to die. No, what do you mean? I said, well, because if they're helpless, can't help themselves. So how long have they been living there? Oh, thousands of years. How long have they been living? Like thousands of years. And then they said, you don't understand. All they have to eat is rice and beans. I said, how long have they eaten rice and beans? Thousands of years. 
here's the thing. People were developing long before we got there, before they got our technologies, before they got our knowledge and wisdom, and people are going to be developing a long time afterwards. It may not look like what you and I see and what we think of. It may not meet our standards, but, but, but they've learned how to do what they do, where they are, and adapt it in a very good way. So as a developed worker, I have to think about how do I work with people who bear the image of God, full of potential beings that I approach. Um, I think of the uh, nursery rhyme we, we tell about in the United States. I told my children growing up, there was a cat who went to London to visit the queen. And this cat could talk, so you know it's a nursery rhyme. So the cat is it's called Pussycat, Pussycat. The narrator says, where have you been? And the cat says to the narrator, I've been to London to visit the queen. He went to the palace. And then the narrator says, Pussycat, Pussycat, what did you there? And the Pussycat said, I saw a mouse under the chair. Ah. Now a cat sees a cat because a cat, a cat sees a mouse because a cat is a cat, right? Absolutely. And, and we have to be careful as we go in and develop. People have amazing ways to solve their own problems, but if we go in with our own preconceived ideas, sometimes we rob them of that ability to see and use their own resources. Okay, enough of that. The greatest resource in your development is not the ideas that you and I have. It's the people in the community that we go to work with. Okay. Okay, this is like a community, right? You try to kill this squirrel, and you don't realize what's going on in this squirrel's life? Good luck. Also, another lesson learned from working with people. Technology can help, but technology isn't the universal solution. Uh, this was on a farm, in development farm. We went and saw the first tractor they showed us. The government said, what would help to develop your government farm? We need a tractor. They took us to the first one. It was an international harvester from the USA in the 40s and 50s. Then they took us to the next one. It was a Ford from the 60s and 70s, looking just like that. The third one they took us was a Kubota from the 80s and 90s. They said, oh, if you would just buy us a tractor, we could develop. Yeah. Well, technology can help, but it's not always the answer, is it? Oh, sorry about that. Um, I love technology. I love to use it. I don't understand how a lot of it works, but I like to use it. Some technology jumps have been amazingly good in terms of helping people. Example, uh, in developing countries, use of cell phones, smartphones for communication, medicines such as antibiotics and antiretroviral drugs in sub-Saharan Africa combating HIV. But there's some negatives of technology too that we have to remember. They can occur if we see them as an answer to all the problems. Uh, hybrid seeds, commercial fertilizers, pesticides, genetically modified organisms, they can increase yields amazingly. But they have downsides as well as eradicating local germplasm, hastening soil degradation, uh, placing harmful compounds and chemicals uh, in the food chain. Uh, so we understand that. Uh, all I would say to you as a group like this who's very responsible for helping network and helping people come out of poverty, hunger, and improving lives and using a lot of technology, just realize, as Adam said, uh, Abram said this morning, sorry, Abram, as Abram said this morning, there are no silver bullets that are out there, okay? There are no silver bullets. Okay, here's technology that really doesn't, you know, some people like it, but a lot of people don't like it, you know? The innovation here. Uh, not everybody really appreciates all of our innovation, so these guys down here at the bottom, I don't know how to make this point. Oops. The guys down here at the bottom, they kind of like it, but you can see the guy up there at the top, he's not very happy about it. Yeah. Also, another lesson learned from working people. My experience isn't necessarily transferable to your experience, all right? It just isn't. It could be. It might be. Uh, but my farming of agriculture in the United States, growing up and farming corn and beans and cattle on a small farm of uh, two or 300 acres is probably not going to transfer to a... Uh, a farm in China where they have uh, one-tenth of an acre to farm uh, in a mountain area uh, under rain-fed agriculture. Uh, just remember that as we uh, work with people, one size doesn't fit all. Have you been to the store and bought a one-size-fit-all garment? Does it really? Does it? No. I, you know, really, one size doesn't fit all. And the same thing with our technologies and the, and the, and the schemes and the things that we come up with. Uh, it can help. There are great principles behind it. 
Uh, there are reasons why you and I have done it. There are reasons why it very many differences. Okay. Yeah, so one size doesn't fit all. I learned to do something somewhere, and I came up with a great slogan, and it fits every situation, right? No. Yeah, just do it. That's really not, that's a great slogan for a shoe. It's not great for that guy getting ready to jump off the building. <laughs> Also remember, in, in light of number three, too, principles are, are more important uh, than specifics. Uh, following up with that statement above uh, about uh, our experiences aren't necessarily transferable, you know, it, it, it's, it's like when we develop a new technology like a water filter. Remember that there, there's 500 different types of water filters out there. Mine is good. Yours is good. There's, like, there's only two things you can really do to water to make it drinkable. You can filter it. You can purify it. Or you can combine those two, you know, but that's basically all you can do to water to make it drinkable. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can have all kinds of different, you have in multiple filtrations, you have multiple purifications, all that kind of thing. So remember that as we're talking with people and trying to help them, for instance, if we go into a culture that boils their water to drink, yeah, let's don't introduce a great water filter that will keep them from boiling their water because boiling is a good way to purify water. Remember that. Principles are more important than specifics. Okay, and there you see, there's the laboratory. We're inventing things. We're turning it around and giving it to the farmers. And on the way home, they're tossing it in the ditch. Okay. Number five, lessons learned from working with people. The best starting point, start where people are. Very simple statement, and I think most of you would agree with that. Um, when I started working in rural development in the southern Philippines, I, I thought that I was going to teach them how to farm. Jethro, you think I can teach them how to farm? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but we worked with a great guy named uh, Harold Watson in Wal uh, Warlito Laki Home. And uh, they, they taught me, and I learned very quickly, that probably one of the smartest people in the world was the Filipino farmer. Really. Who else could live on two acres of land, feed and provide for a family of six, send four kids to school with two of them eventually finishing college, take care of their elderly parents, and do all of this on a cash flow of about U.S. $20 per month. If I gave me the same resources that the Filipino farmer had and put me out there on the farm, I would be dead in about two weeks because I've got enough fat to leave over, you know, to, 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 to take me for at least two weeks. But uh, so, so one of the things we learned early on is that where people are, they're already doing some amazing things. And, and instead of introducing things that can change so quickly or drastically, or move them away from what they're doing sustainably, find where they are and maybe start step by step from where they are. Uh, people are in need. Yes, life is a struggle. Poverty is real. I don't want to romanticize poverty. It can be debilitating and life-threatening. And yes, these things we know that we do can help people. But I say the best place to start is not from where we are, what we know as outsiders, but where people are. Small steps involving them working towards long-lasting development. And I'm going to have to close very quickly here so we can get to the next presentation. But I, I wanted to just, uh, oh, oh, by the way, people have an amazing capacity to know where they are. So, so you know, these folks here, they didn't know exactly uh, how to solve their problem, but at least they knew where they were and at least which direction to go. Okay, so let me share with you just in closing, uh, very briefly, three keys to a successful development project. Again, this is our experience, and, and I want to share this uh, in all humility. Um, it, it really is a lot of work of the, the Filipino men and women that we worked with through the years, and then all throughout Asia with, with several teams uh, around um, um, in different countries and different cultures. And... With the fact of doing development, if you want to use that as a verb, doing development for all those years, we, again, we began to shift our metrics from whether we were successful or not, not by how many gardens we implemented, not by how many water projects we put in, uh, not by how many people we trained or, or health practices we implemented. Th those were good things. Don't hear me say those are bad things. We, we still measure those, by the way. That the donors like to see those, and that's how they fund our projects. Uh, we still measure those types of things. But we began to shift... Is there another way? Is there a way to measure software, the things that are happening not physically in the communities, but happening in the lives and the hearts of peoples and communities? Would that be a different way to maybe measure 
and help us understand, are we getting towards sustainable development? And so we began asking a, a couple of questions. And so I just proposed three, three things that, that we would say we see it, uh, in our development projects that, 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 that bring about success. First of all, is it participatory? Uh, is it us not doing things for people, by people, but really with people? And, and this is ECHO. This is the heart of ECHO. This is what you guys do, and many of you in this network, really going out and working and learning from and, and, and partnering, coming alongside. And one, one of the things that I've seen over and over, if, if people are involved in their process, if they have the ownership from the very beginning, we don't have to worry about turning things over. Okay? We don't have to worry about having to turn over. You know, we've done a project, now let's turn it over. Most of those projects don't last very long. They can, but most of them don't. Uh, if they're involved in that process and they own from the beginning, so when we get to the end, they say, it's ours. It always was ours. We don't have to worry about that. Um, I'll be leading a little bit uh, this afternoon, about 3 o'clock, those that are interested in looking at some of the community development tools. Uh, I'll be leading that. We'll actually look at specific tools. How do, we, how do we ensure and how do we measure that in the communities that we're working in? Another thing that we would ask, is it sustainable? Uh, if it's not participatory, we would say it's probably not going to be sustainable. If people aren't buying into the process, if they're not stakeholders from the very beginning, then it's probably not going to be the second one. But, but sustainable is a good and overused word, of course. It basically means to hold up with support from underneath. It implies the maintaining, keeping going of an action of a process. So when we look back at all the things we do to help communities in the development process, what do we see? The things that last are pretty much the sustainable things. If we're going to build structures like community water systems or involved in distributing improved or livestock and planting materials, those are good things. If it's sustainable, we should be able to look back and see how people are using those and ultimate, ultimately propagating what they've uh, learned from and what they benefited from. Uh, unfortunately, what we found early on because of the way that we work, the distribution programs instead of really involvement programs, most of the work uh, was done in a way that looked forward to the next project and the next challenge and the next set of goals. So participatory community development has made me a much better person in seeing sustainable results. Uh, from one, it works from the belief that we're not taking things to the community, but working with the community to come up with solutions for their projects. And the third thing we want to say is, it not only is it participatory, is it sustainable, but is it transformational? Uh, I'm going to be a, a little careful here, but, you know, we, we want to see people get better roads, uh, better food, better health. Those are good things. But, but I think in development, we've got to think about the process. How do they get better roads? How do they get better food? Is it something we give them, or is it something that comes from them? It doesn't mean that they have all the knowledge and resources to do that, but in the process, how, how do they take charge of that in their development so that when we're long gone, not only do they have a better road and better food, but now they have tools to serve, solve all other kinds of problems as well. So some of the things that we would look for measuring would be, uh, what happened to the confidence of the community? Did it get better or did it get worse? Or did it get to say, hey, we're going to develop by waiting on the next NGO to come in and drop off the next round of whatever handout that we have? Or is it a community who said, hey, we're poor, but you know what? We did it ourselves, and we think we can do other projects as well. Did it build capabilities and abilities in the community of how they learn how to tap local resources or even regional or even national resources? Did it build capacities where they could handle maybe one problem here, but tomorrow, because they're getting better as community, they can handle much larger problems? Did it build better community? Did we go in and help one person, and everybody else in the community hates that one person now because we helped them and not everybody else? Uh, did it build a better community of working together for the common good of the community? Uh, did it build better character? Did it change the hearts of the people? I uh, had the privilege of, several years ago of working uh, in the central Philippines with an organization to evaluate a, a development project. Uh, they had uh, done a lot of good work uh, in this island uh, of uh, the central Philippines. They had seen uh, a lot of good measurables in terms of number of projects going in. Uh, they had also seen a measurable increase in income 
uh, somewhere 100, sometimes even 200 percent. And they were seeing all of these physical indicators that were measuring, uh, uh, by all means, great progress in their development project. But also they saw worse communities in terms of relationships. They saw communities that were struggling in areas. And so we did a little assessment with them, and, and we looked at what, what was the difference, what was going on. And, and we actually traced the extra income. Where was it going, this extra 100%, 200%? We found out the extra income was not going for food. It wasn't going for families. It wasn't going for education. The extra income was going for alcohol, cigarettes, gambling, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if we just base the physical results and say that's what development is, then we miss a, we miss a key point. Uh, we would say, it might make us some uncomfortable, I believe that surface transformation is good, but heart transformation of people is the goal. People with more things is not bad, but people who are better people, better fathers, mothers, better family members, is, well, it's even better. People with access to communications and modern luxuries is not bad, but communities with right relationships is what we want to see. Right relationships with each other, right relationships to their self, to their environment, and right relationships with God. Well, I'm at my conclusion. And you're saying, oh, thank you so much <laughs> for being finished. Uh, I would say it's okay to have a million solutions and answers, but it's even better to have 10 million questions uh, as we go. Again, everybody knows this, the old Chinese proverb. Go to the people, live with them, learn from them, love them, start with what they know, build on what they have, but the best of the leaders, when all their work is accomplished, their work is done, the people all remark, we have done it ourselves. So thank you to Echo for letting me be with you today. Thank you to all of you that are spending your time, your resources, and your lives in helping to improve the lives of people all across Asia and the places that you live. I pray God's blessings upon you. And uh, I also look forward to dialoguing with you the next few days to talk about some nice software things maybe that we can do to help us do what we are passionate about, and that's improving lives of those that we work with. Thank you. God bless.